Okay. Welcome. You're listening to The Best of Investing. I'm your host, Edward Brown. My two co-hosts, Mark Honf and Nam Phan, are off today, but we do have a special guest that we're going to introduce in just a second here. Our phone number is 888-912-1190. Use that number to answer the trivia questions for a five-pack tanning certificate given away during this show. That certificate is not sponsored by the radio station, but by Tan Bella Tanning Salon with two locations in San Francisco and one in Marin. I think they were actually voted uh, best in uh, tanning in the Bay Area, but uh, don't take my word for it. Uh, and those certificates are um, transferable and they're each worth over $100. So it's a nice little gift. Today's trivia theme in honor of our special guest who loves baseball is Baseball's Over Easy. This is the name of the, uh, the, the uh, uh, theme of our trivia. All right, now oh, we're gonna introduce our special guest right now. Uh, Real estate attorney and good friend of mine, Spencer Shear. I'm going to give you a quick little uh, background here. So Spencer Shear is a managing partner for Shear Law Group, an AV, which you're going to have to explain what that means, uh, rated law firm representing lenders, landlords, and investors in consumer and commercial real estate matters throughout the state of California. Uh, he has offices in Northern California and Orange County. Successful litigator, having tried over 200 cases, uh, lender advocate, and uh, he's also a nationally known podcast. He has a, a nationally known podcast called Truth Serum, providing legal updates and interviews with interesting guests from all walks of life. Uh, let's see. We're going to introduce you now. Spencer, how are you? Welcome to good. the of <laughs> Thank you. You know, I, I just, you got me going on a hundred different things. Your first I would, yeah, it wasn't in my uh, bio, but uh, for the tanning uh, contest there for to win the uh, for the tanning salon there, I, I was voted having the whitest legs in America. So this is good. <laughs> <laughs> well, then maybe maybe you could use the certificate. Okay. Yeah. Uh, all right. So we had a lot to talk about. You, you uh, sent me a lot of good uh, topics. Uh, so I'm going to warn the audience ahead of time. A lot of the stuff is going to be fairly sophisticated for the real estate investors. I started looking at some of the list here, and uh, uh, it's, I don't say it's not for the faint of heart. Let's put it that way. <laughs> All right, so uh, let's start right out. Uh, new laws and cases, uh, case decisions dramatically impacting lenders and investors have been enacted in California, effective 2023. You want to give us a, a, a rundown? Yeah, let me ask you, do you want to, you know, it might be good just for a segue in there because you're right, a lot of this stuff is technical. Just to hit on some of the economic background, you want to do that first, or you want to say absolutely? This Go ahead. All right, good. Yeah, because I, I think you know you're right now. It is amazing what is going on. I mean, if, for those who are in, uh, investing in the stock market, one day it's going to be recession, next day it's, it's bull market. We're rearing back. Real yeah. estate values up, down. I mean, it, this is probably one of the most uncertain times ever, and yeah. I think that has to be a background for whatever investors in real estate think about. So, I think it'd be good to talk about it again. I'm not. I, you know, I have no crystal ball, but I follow the market closely, the real estate market, and sure. uh, it's just amazing what's going on now. So, for background for me, I mean, I don't think you can throw like this country did, you know, between seven and nine trillion dollars into the economy, uh, and just expect that there's not going to be repercussions. That everybody can stay home, everybody gets checks, nobody has to pay their rent, mortgage payments, anything else, and. Uh, that you're just going to have an economy that goes on. And the battle yeah, and now... You know what, that reminds me, because right now the Supreme Court is looking at the uh, student debt uh, yeah. limit for you know, 10000 20000 whatever, which is, you know, it's just a scheme to try to buy votes. It's totally political because there's no uh, uh, legal standing that the, the, the president has to eliminate that. But you know what? If I was at Washington, D.C. with all those students, I would hang up, I'd hold a big sign that just says, please eliminate my mortgage debt. Why not? Absolutely. And my, and my credit so. cards and, uh, you know, any other loan I've got, my car loan, you know, eliminate my car loan debt. Why not? Yeah, I mean, again, that's a, a, it's a sophisticated, nuanced argument, depending on who's, you know, on one side of the megaphone or the other. But it's easier to be able to say for people who are students, they haven't got their start in life and, you know, they were poor oppressed. I mean, I get the whole argument and you can argue equity and scream about that. But you're absolutely right for those people. Uh, who pay on their loans or who invested in the business and didn't go to college and they're not getting forgiveness. 
I mean, what about them? So it, it's and, a, and, and because I get paid off by student loans, do I get that money back? Somebody actually asked Elizabeth Warren that, and she just scoffed at him. She's like, oh, no. It's like, really? Why not? I mean, make it retroactive if you're going to do that. Yeah. Well, that, that's interesting because, I mean, that, that it just keys into the overall macro stuff that we're talking about on the economy. And that is, you know, you get to a certain point where if you're just loading it on the backs of those who can, uh, either you're going to have higher taxes and inflation or you're going to have a recession and readjustment of uh, the economic conditions to reflect, you know, what is the, the true economy. And I think that is the battle right now. And you've got people on both sides of that betting heavily. Uh, yeah. And the real estate market certainly has been a recipient of uh, jacked up prices. But okay. I think that right now you will see by the end of the year uh, how it turns. Either inflation is here to stay, which is possible, along with a recession, which is the worst possible outcome. Yeah. Stagflation. Good. Yeah. yeah. Or you'll see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, tell you what, we're going to cut we're going to cut to a, uh, our first commercial break. Uh, our trivia theme is baseballs over easy. By the way, if I was a uh, uh, a candidate, I think what I would do, uh, like they used to do in kindergarten, uh, when you wanted to win something, you know, uh, be a president of kindergarten or something, I'd just say, you know what, I'm going to run a campaign. Anybody who votes for me gets a million dollars. I'm gonna, when I get when I become president, I'm just going to print a million dollars and give it to everybody who votes for me. Sounds legal, doesn't it? All right, here's our first trivia question. Uh, I obviously I say that tongue in cheek. Okay, here we go. Uh, in 2000, actually, you know what? I'm going to ask this other one. Um, okay. Trying to mimic the New York Yankees of old, which team went to five World Series in the 1990s? All right. Call 888-912-1190. First caller with the correct answer wins that tanning certificate. Stay with us. The best of investing. I'll be right back. Welcome back to The Best of Investing. I'm Edward Brown, your host, along with my special guest, Spencer Shear. Before we ask our, our trivia question, I do want to make a quick mention here for the Mount View Hotel and Spa in Calistoga. Right now, they are offering 25% off of all rooms this season. Check them out at mountviewhotel.com. They have one of the nicest pools around. It's very, very comfortable. Check them out. Been there a couple of times. Love it. All right, here is our first trivia question. Trying to mimic the New York Yankees of old, which team went to five World Series in the 1990s? Now you can answer, Spencer. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm, I'm not Googling this, so I don't know. But if I had a guess, I'd say Tampa Bay. No, no, no. Uh, the Atlanta Braves in the 90s. Remember, they only Very won good. one, but they lost four of them. All right. Yeah, I forgot. I've been trying to forget that. Okay. All right. So uh, why don't you continue on, uh, Spencer, because I know we were talking about the, you know, the economy, where you think real estate's going. Um, and then uh, uh, I'll let you take it because you have a, a lot of good stuff to cover. But Yeah, just to finish off what I was saying before is that, again, the worst possible outcome for everybody is stagflation. You have the rates going up yeah. and uh, you have, uh, you know, inflation and you have a uh, economic recession at the same time. And yeah. A lot of people have been betting on the idea that the Fed's going to stop raising the rates, uh, if not, you know, next quarter, soon thereafter, and then we're going to go back into a deflationary uh, or, or a, a disinflationary environment where, again, uh, you have free and easy money. And it sounds right if there's a normal inflation without, excuse me, if there's a normal recession without inflation. But I'm starting to see signs now, same as you are. You go to the grocery store, prices are still elevated. Wages are, and that is the real issue. Uh, I have never seen a job market like this in my life. We used to put out, uh, you know, ads for uh, both, you know, attorneys and staff, and we get 100 resumes. Now you've got to send invitations to people on and LinkedIn and Indeed to get them to apply. That, and again, that, if that I kind mean, of I mean, sticks. I remember my first year out of college or while I was, so while I was in college, ready to graduate, that's when, you know, interest rates were 20% and Carter was uh, yeah. actually, let's see, yeah, Carter was still in and it was awful. And it was, uh, I mean, you were lucky to get a job. Uh, now, like you said, it's, it's these, these, uh, these employees, you know, they're kind of picking and choosing. Uh, no, uh, wait a minute. I'm waking up at eight. I got, you mean I got to show up at 9 a.m.? I can't, I can't live under that condition, you know? <laughs> or even show up. I want remote only. Yeah, what's going to happen when a lot of these companies are going to uh, strongly suggest that people come back to work, you know, in the office versus uh, uh, remote? A whole other digression, but there's a, like, what's another interesting takeoff on that, again, we're digressing, but uh, 
you know, again, they, they declared the COVID emergency over in California, yet Cal OSHA is still leaving the COVID uh, mandates, you know, for protection and for, uh, you know, keeping, uh, you know, sanitary conditions in place. So what the problem is, is that if you we force people to come back to work and there is another outbreak or pandemic or whatever, you get sued out of existence if you don't maintain the same stringent standards you did when the pandemic was in place. So, well, yeah, so, so if they go to the grocery store and they get uh, COVID, uh, but they don't know where it came from, I mean, you don't know where it's going to come from. And, and the thing is, you know, with inflation, all of this talk of 6%, 8%, whatever, I think inflation is closer to 25 to 30%. I mean, when I go to the grocery store, and especially, you know, you've heard of shrinkflation, right, where they charge you basically the same thing and they cut it a third, you know, it's, it's literally, um, you know, it was a like, uh, I, I mentioned this before on the show, uh, I used to buy a 12 pack of, uh, you know, um, sparkling soda, so to speak, right? And it would cost me three bucks. And now an eight pack cost me close to three bucks, close, close to the same price. I mean, that's a 33% inflation rate. So, you know, yeah, maybe gas is, has not gone up from where it went skyrocketing. You know, yeah, it came down from eight bucks down to, you know, six bucks and five bucks. But, you know, when uh, El Presidente Trump left office, it was, uh, you know, what about $2.20 a gallon or something like that? I mean, you know, national average or something. So, yeah. Yeah, you could, you could make an argument that without draining the uh, the SPR, the uh, Strategic Petroleum Reserve, you'd probably have gas prices now at $6 or $7. But... Yeah, I don't know how much that really helped. Because, you know, you have to pump a lot more, you know. I mean, I mean this, this whole thing about, uh, they call it Putin's war. And it's like, you, you know what, this war could have been over really quickly if we would have opened up the pipeline and basically bankrupt, uh, so to speak, Russia. Because we could have depressed the prices down to, you know, 20 bucks a gallon uh, or $20 a barrel, let's say. And, and then they just couldn't pump the oil, which so... I, I kind of blame the, uh, the our administration for uh, assisting Putin. Let's put it that way. So anyway, that's beyond beyond our, our scope of what we're we're focusing on real estate and real estate law here. Yeah, and again, just on a macro level, to lead it back to uh, some of the real estate laws, is that uh, this is the battle being played out right now, and you're you're seeing what most people or economists were were thinking at least at the end of last year, beginning of this year, was that you were going to see recession. And uh, that, that would drive back, again, the disinflationary uh, process that was in play before, and the Fed couldn't keep the rates up. But this is a battle that has to be fought, has to be won. And if it isn't, uh, and you do see that prices stay up, you know, the impact on, uh, on assets is going to be uh, profound. And real estate investors in particular have to make the right call. You've seen in commercial real estate, uh, it's hard to get people in offices, and you're seeing uh, drastic vacancy rates all over the place, including Manhattan. And uh, there's a question as to whether you're going to see the, the market tank. In residential real estate, uh, we have warehoused, just like stimulus was given out in a form of checks to people, there was huge hidden stimulus given out in uh, rent forbearance and mortgage forbearance. And a lot of these government agencies, GSD, are warehousing bad loans, both commercial and uh, residential. And you're starting to see uh, these things not hit the market as the courts open up again, and there's more foreclosures, evictions. Last month, bankruptcy increased with were double digits. So I'm just saying, hang on to your habits. You've got to call this right. If you don't, uh, you know, you're going to get stuck you know, on the high end of uh, assets that are deflating, or you're going to hang on to those that will inflate along with it and maybe ride it out. But yeah, because you know, the one thing I liked about, or I always like about real estate, specifically residential real estate, everybody needs a place to live. And I've said this before, yeah. you know, is that no matter how bad the economy gets, I'm not going to live in a tent. I, I might have to downsize, but I'll still live somewhere, be, even if it's an apartment or something, right? So uh, the one thing is, is, I mean, if you have an absolute catastrophic def, um, population go down, which we've actually had the opposite of letting the borders open, you know, and all those immigrants have to live somewhere, right? So in one case, it's actually a little bit helpful. So anyway, we got to cut to our second commercial break here. Um, here uh, we go. Uh, in 2003, the GOAT, supposedly uh, got to the Cubs again in their quest for a World Series in the NLCS against the Marlins. An unnamed fan 
Steve Bartman, um, was involved in a controversy on whether he interfered with a fly ball down the left field line. This was blamed, uh, given the uh, this was the blame given to the Cubs to, for losing the, the uh, series. Uh, at the time of the replays, uh, who was the left fielder who did not come up with the ball? That's our trivia question. Stay with us. The best of investing. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the best of investing. One more time. I'm Edward Brown, your host, along with Spencer Shear, my special guest here. Uh, trivia question number two. Um, basically, here's what we're looking at. Bar Steve Bartman interfered potentially uh, with a ball in the 2003 NLCS uh, against the Marlins. Marlins ended up winning. Uh, the question is, who was the left fielder who did not come up with the ball? And it's interesting because he was so irate. If he had just not been as irate, I think the fans would have kind of eased up a bit. And Steve Bartman ended up having to like change his name. I mean, it's just awful what happened to that poor guy. Uh, Moises Alou. You remember that? Wow. Moises Alou? Yeah, he was there. I mean, now, now it's making sense. I would have never known that. Never knew that? Okay. Well, you know, it's funny, 2003, it's like, gosh, that was 20 years ago. All right, uh, Spencer, um, so give the listeners an update of uh, foreclosure sales purchasers can now expect in California. Since yeah, that, that's something that in, anybody investing, especially in a, a single family one before residential properties, you have to stay aware of that. I mean, I just as a little bit of a background, California is primarily a non-judicial foreclosure state, meaning that you don't have to go through court to foreclose. If there's a default, you go through a statutory process with a trustee. Uh, for years, it's been a pretty stable process. They've been uh, chipping away at some of the requirements over the years. But more recently, especially in response to uh, economic downturn and COVID, they've changed the foreclosure laws drastically, meaning that-, that SB 1079? Yeah, SB 1079. Yes, 10, 10, Yes, SB 1079 and its progeny. And what they've essentially done is they've changed the foreclosure statute so that sales are no longer final on the day that the gavel hits and the sale is actually held. So what they've done in 1079 is they said, look, again, a social construct, what they're saying is we want to give more people the opportunity to own or occupy properties, people who want, who are renters who live in the property, give them a chance to own it. People who are not or can't afford a property and they want to buy it and live in it. Those people have preferred status as opposed to lenders who will foreclose and sell it uh, you know, to investors or flippers. So the, the legislature passed 1079. Okay, so let me, let me, if, I, if I remember correctly, tell me if I'm wrong, but it, so we're talking about uh, the renter potentially has a right, uh, I won't call it a right of redemption because they're not actually technically the borrower, um, but they potentially can buy the property after the sale or a nonprofit. I mean, you can't right. You can't. You can't just have anybody off the off the street say, "Hey, uh, the foreclosure sales already happened, and I just want to go ahead and bid right now." Right? No, no. They, they, what they, they what they've done is define what they've called a list of eligible bidders, oh. and the ones we've said are primarily the, there's really three classes. There are tenants who live on the property. Okay. There are people who want to will will testify and swear that they will own or occupy the property. Or well, there's nonprofits and there's various hierarchies of the nonprofits that agree that if they buy the property, they'll sell to people who will own or occupy the property. Okay, so so, so here, okay, so so that's the, that third one, or in this case, the second one you mentioned. So somebody who can show up afterward, let the sale happen, and then say, uh, I think it's within 45 days or something, right? Say, uh, you know, hey, I want to go ahead and match the offer. That was uh, the high bid, probably credit bid by the, the lender, uh, but I promise I'll, I'll own or occupy it. Here's the problem with all of this, is the bar, you've really kind of cheated the borrower uh, who, who defaulted, because now I can't imagine anybody showing up at a foreclosure sale and bidding, because th they could bid, 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 and then they get wiped out, or not wiped out, but they, they don't get to own the property after they're the high bidder because the it doesn't it's not a final bid right yeah and again let me just set the stage a little bit on the timing so what happens is that there's a preferred status where someone can match if they're an owner occupant tenant and they want to you know buy and stay on the property other than that you have uh, theoretically competitive bidding from the uh those who want to own or occupy it and nonprofits. they can neither uh, match the bid or bid it up but i uh, you know, whether or not the fairness of what happens is they have to submit these bids uh, within 15 days of the sale. 
They don't have to submit the cash, but within 15 days. And then if they do that and they're a qualified bidder, then they have up to 45 days in which to submit the actual funding. So uh, it's a process that really ties up the finality of the sale at least for 15 days. And as long as, you know, 45 days leaves great uncertainty. You know, the, the, but the, here's, I mean, I can imagine the situation and this is going to happen. This is going to happen. You have somebody who uh, is, uh, so, so it doesn't have to be a, um, uh, again, it really, it's, it's any one to four, um, it can be a primary residence, right? It doesn't have to be a rental that, right? I mean, so if I, I've lived in, I live in my house and uh, I'm having some f weird situation where I can't pay my mortgage and I get foreclosed out, it's not a final sale for at least 15 days, right? So, yeah, on a, a one or single family unit property. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay, so let, let's take the scenario and just make the number simple. House is worth a million dollars. I only owe three hundred thousand dollars, and I get in a car accident or something, whatever the reason, and I can't pay my mortgage, um, and I don't really, you know, maybe don't have enough time to sell it, or I, I guess theoretically I could sell it, but you know, a lot of people just don't do anything, right? And one would think, well, gosh, if it's at three hundred thousand, and that lender's owed, you know, three, let's just say three hundred thousand, and bids three hundred thousand, you would think that there'd be somebody who would show up at the sale who would bid it up. To four or yeah. five thousand. Now that ain't going to happen, and so the you know ordinarily the borrower would be able to walk away with some cash. Now there's almost almost a hundred percent certainty that the that the borrower will walk away with zero. Well, I, I, I that is, there's some complexity to what you just said. That example is that I I, I thought you were going to say a situation where somebody you know they owe three hundred thousand, the property's worth a million, and and the lender just forecloses for three hundred thousand, no one bids. In fact, that spurred this whole legislative effort to require that lenders, excuse me, that lenders and the foreclosure trustees market the property for the highest value on behalf of the borrower. That legislative bid failed last year in California, although yeah. they're going to try and bring it back. But your scenario is if somebody comes in for three hundred thousand, you know, the road, and uh, and nobody bids at the sale. I, uh, you know, at, at this point in time, if, if nobody bids, the lender gets a windfall unless there's an overbid. You still have all these classes of people that can come in within that 15-day period and overbid. Okay, tell you what, with Spencer, I know I got, I'm going to let you talk a lot more next time because I've been doing too much talking. Stay with us. The Best of Investing will be right back. Welcome back to The Best of Investing. Edward Brown here along with Spencer Shear. Uh, we're going to ask our trivia question next time uh, in the next segment. All right. Uh, or at the end of this segment. All right, Spencer, take it away. Yeah, finishing up just on, on the foreclosure items. And again, uh, SB 1079 was the parent or the uh, statute that launched all these foreclosure sale finality changes. And they've modified that twice since then. And the most recent one is AB 1837. They found out that a lot of uh, the people who were submitting bids really weren't legitimate nonprofits or maybe they were saying that they're tenant occupants and they really weren't, or maybe the borrower was putting someone up to claiming they were so they could stall the sale. There was a bunch of things. So they tightened up the statute a lot. And now nonprofits have to uh, report and verify and do a host of items to verify that they are. Uh, people have to sign affidavits now before with the, they could just submit a bid. Now they have to do it with the bid, attesting under penalty of perjury that they truly are who they say they are. And one other item that's worth noting is that they've they actually attached another thing. Let's say the lender is a successful bidder at foreclosure. There are no overbids or none that, that really work out. The lender is required under these new laws now to actually market the property uh, to tenant or, or owner occupants for the first 30 days. So they're even trying to stretch it out farther saying, lender, even if you are the successful bidder on these covered properties, you've got to market to these owner occupants at least for a while to show that you're giving them a chance. And the last item I wanted to note, if you're a nonprofit or anybody buying these properties, saying that you're going to use them for uh, rental, or excuse me, for owner-occupant purposes, you now have to include a covenant that runs with the land for 30 years uh, that's recorded to ensure that you really do what you say. So the legislature realizes there's a lot of corruption and they try to address it. Absolutely. Well, wait a minute now. So um, let's say I'm the lender. I foreclose. Yep. Uh, so for the first 15 days, I, ju I can I just do nothing. I can't do anything. So after 15 days, nobody's uh, bid. So uh, now technically I'm the owner of it. 
And you're saying for the next 30 days, I need to put it on the market? Yes. Yeah, so, so again, on a covered property, if I, it turns out that you are the successful bidder, the foreclosing lender, you record your trustee's deed, then uh, you've got to market, when you market that property, as soon as you put it on MLS, you're going to have to market to a specified group of people and allow them the opportunity to buy. Uh, again, I, I, I haven't drilled down enough and I don't. At what price and who gets the excess? Yeah, that was the next item. And again, I, I don't think that there's anything in the statute that says what price you have to sell them at. I think you have to market to this group of people, owner occupants. Uh, I don't think there's a restriction on the price, but I'm saying at least I mean, what that, they're doing is saying. That's, that's, that's so ridiculous because ordinarily, uh, ordinarily, if I'm the lender, I, I want, I just want, you know, either my money back or my money back with a profit. I, I'm usually not trying to foreclose so that I can turn it into a rental. So it, it just, it's kind of a, to me, it's sort of a silly statute because I would, I would market the property anyway. Right, you will. But again, I, what they're trying to do, and this is covered for anybody who can't sleep at night and wants to read themselves to sleep, Civil Code 2924P. Okay. Uh, this is designed to say that we don't want flippers and people getting together or just taking these properties and just turning them over. And, uh, you know, that there's really a detriment to what they believe is a housing shortage. We want these people, meaning those who want to own or occupy properties, to have the first crack at doing it. And that's what this is. And then S is carrying all the way, not only through the foreclosure process, but beyond. Yeah, but how do you do that 30 year though? Where, the, where, so run that one year. So if you're, not, if, if you're a nonprofit and you're buying the, the property, swearing that you are, and you're going to use it for purposes of uh, either low income housing or for owner occupants, yeah. then you've got to now write into your deed uh, or record a separate document, a covenant that in effect says that this promise to rent to either uh, low-income tenants or owner occupants will be on this property for 30 years. So if I'm a potential buyer of that property, I am buying it with the idea that I can not rent it for the next 30 years. I, I get, like I could live in the property for 10 years, but I, I, that's, but I can't rent it after that for another 20 years. Well, no, say, well, say you're an owner occupant that buys under these conditions yeah. and then decide you don't want to be an owner occupant anymore. Either you're going to sell to another owner occupant or you're going to have to sell to a low income housing, uh, uh, somebody who qualifies as low income housing. Yeah, good luck trying to sell to somebody. You know, I mean, most people want to buy a personal residence thinking, sure, I'm going to go ahead and live in it. But if you're going to put a little covenant in there that says, oh, by the way, for the next 30 years, you know, you, you, here's some restrictions. It's like, no, just I just want to buy a house and do what I want. As long as I don't put a nuclear power plant on the, in the backyard, let me do what I want, you know? <laughs> yeah, you're talking pre-COVID old America. That's not the, the country we live in anymore. It is, uh, you know, very much different. But I will say this, that they realized a lot of these nonprofits were just, they were just fronts. And they weren't, they're, all they were doing was flipping the properties. And they were buying you know, properties that, you know, like Malibu, I, have, I could tell you the various <laughs> cases that I've been tracking where you're never going to stick a low income uh, person in there. It's never going to be affordable housing. It was done strictly as a financial uh, ga uh, gain on the basis of uh, the alleged uh, but, nonprofit. But if they sold it to somebody who was an owner occupant, that's okay, right? Would have been okay, yes. But I'm saying that a lot of times it was just... Uh, gotcha. They, they were just, I got to say, honestly, I've actually participated in that. Um, you know, we are part of a group that was part of the nonprofit and we did it the right way. I mean, we literally, we're, we're not turning it into rentals, you know, it's not a front. We're, we're fixing it up and selling it to a real homeowner. So we're, we're, we're the good guys. <laughs> no, I, there are some good guys out there. I'm glad you're one of them. <laughs> you wouldn't be on my show if you, if I wasn't a good guy, I know. Um, of course not. No, you are a good guy. I'm not, uh, not just stroking. I think, uh. You know, you do a good job. You run a, a very reputable business, but I'm just saying to you right now, I mean, it is just that over-regulation and they are trying to weed out those who are not and maybe give a hand up to those who don't deserve it and maybe some who do. It's just, it's a whole different show now. All right, we have, believe it or not, we only have one more minute left in this segment. Um, if you could give us a, a quick rundown on the issue with default interest on loans. Yeah, maybe we could do, I mean, yeah, maybe, the let me give a little bit more time to that one, because I think for anybody who's covered by that this issue, they're going to want to know. I don't think one minute's going to be enough, but just to whet the appetite, I will say this. Many people, uh, who are, many lenders, whether you call yourself a hard money lender or whatever, think that you are 
able to avoid uh, usury restrictions and uh, to charge higher rates because uh, it's a quote unquote business purpose loan. Don't be fooled now. You're in trouble if you don't watch out for the laws. I, I know the exact case you're talking about. Um, okay, I tell you what, we're going to cut to our uh, third trivia question here. All right, Babe Ruth is quite well known for his times with the New York Yankees and the controversy that surrounded him being sold by the Boston Red Sox. Which was the third and only other team that Ruth played with in his major league career? If I remember correctly, didn't he start off with the Baltimore Orioles? But but, but he didn't even get a chance to play for them because they traded him. They, they traded his contract, I think, to uh, Boston. And then so anyway, so he played for the Boston Red Sox for a while, won a World Series, nineteen seventeen, I think it was. And then, um, in 1918, excuse me. And then he went to uh, the New York Yankees. That's that's how we all know him. But what was his third team that he played for after the New York Yankees before he retired? I think he only played one year with them. Sorry, sorry, I have these tough questions for you, my friend. Call 888-912-1190. First caller with correct answer wins that Danny certificate. Stay with us. The best of investing. I'll be right back. Welcome back to the best of investing. Last time for today, I'm Edward Brown, your host, along with Spencer Shear. A third trivia question: Babe Ruth. We all know he played for the Yankees. Prior to that, he played for the Boston Red Sox. But after the Yankees, he played one year. Who did he play with? Boy, I, I, great question. Curse of the Bambino. I lived that for many years as a New Englander. <laughs> but I, I did at one point before uh, before this day and age remember that. But I, I guess Giants or Pirates. No, it was actually the Boston Braves, and uh, I think he hit a home run. Yeah, he hit a home run uh, in Forbes Field, which was like you know nobody ever hit a home run there. So he 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 went out with uh, swinging, as I say. All right, uh, this, this is a short. Stop on that one second. So I mean, why didn't that reverse the curse? I mean, if if the Red Sox sold him and they were cursed, and he went back to a Boston team, why wouldn't that have reversed the curse? <laughs> because it was I mean, I it was the Boston Braves. That's why. Uh, that's the reason. Right. Okay, uh, so we only have a few minutes to go, and uh, this is very interesting. This uh, default interest situation. Go ahead and uh, explain it to us. All right, let me set the cake. And again, for uh, for baking here, there's a few, only a few that will really get this, but you need to understand this if you're one of the people I'm describing. Uh, generally, under California on covered loans, which are any consumer loan for consumer purpose secured by residential real estate, you're going to be governed by a host of laws that require significant disclosures, restrictions on what you can charge, and uh, uh, limitations on both interest rates especially. So there are ways out of those restrictions if you're not making a consumer loan, and many people make what they call their business purpose loans or yep. investment purpose loans, uh, believing that they're exempt from these laws, both the usury restrictions, prohibiting your interest rate caps, and uh, also uh, the whether you can charge some of these charges that are not allowed on consumer loans like default interest or uh, you know, cascading late charges or whatever. So recently two cases came out that have put a serious dent in those protections. Now, again, assuming you do have a legitimate business purpose or investment purpose loan, the question is, are you exempt from let's say first the usury restrictions, meaning that can you charge more than the legal rate of interest, not 10% in California? And they, they the general idea was, yes, you can, as long as you are uh, one of the exempt classes with mortgage brokers and it's a, a non-consumer business purpose loan. But what a new case came out called In Ray Moon, and it says, uh, no, that may not be the case in the context of a loan workout. So say you are exempt at the beginning and you do a workout with your borrower. Your borrower can't pay. You extend the due date on the note or give them a forbearance agreement or something that allows uh, them to cure a default. And that workout agreement is not negotiated or affected by an exempt entity like a mortgage broker. It's done by the lender or the investor themselves. You can lose the user exemption. Boing, that's number one. Number two, the case of Inray Honchara, which has caused a lot of uh, consternation in what I call the hard money lending circles. Again, many of the loan documents for exempt loans, meaning that are non-consumer loans, business purpose, investment purpose loans allow in position of charges that aren't allowed on consumer loans. And one of the charges is, is default interest, meaning that if you default on your loan, that uh, I can take the interest rate that might be say eight or 10% and make it into 15 or 20%. Again, uh, there's been challenges and fights about that all along. And so oftentimes 
carried out in the bankruptcy court, but this case, Honchera, came out in California. It's an appellate decision, and uh, it's now good law. Supreme Court, California, decided to decline to hear it. And what they're saying basically is, look, uh, you get a chance when somebody misses a payment to assess a late charge. That's your damage for them not making their payment on time. Okay. And if then you're saying, in, in addition to the late charge, we're going to now charge default interest based on the whole principal balance of the loan and charge that on top of the late charges, all of this is a penalty. There's no real reason to do this other than to penalize somebody, and that's not allowed under California law under the Civil Code. And unless you can show uh, a legitimate reason that you bargained for this default interest rate, or the only other exception that you can possibly argue is that the loan had matured and that therefore there's increased risk and uh, you're, you're charging the increased default rate on that basis, the borrower can challenge the imposition of default interest. Okay, it's Spencer, how do people, how do, we got to cut out here. This has been great. We're going to definitely have you on again. Yep. How do people get a hold of you if they have questions on real estate law? Uh, you could, Sheer Law Group, uh, again, we're in Northern California and Orange County. We handle uh, matters for lenders, investors, and landlords across the state, or uh, you can uh, www.sheerlawgroup.com. All right, thank you. Okay, here's our thoughts for the day. Before the crowbar was invented, the crows just drank at home. And I saw a microbiologist today. He was much bigger than I expected. And uh, I'm trying to organize a hide and seek tournament, but good players are hard to find. All right, tune in next week to The Best of Investing. We're going to be giving away more free prizes for answering trivia questions and, uh, of course, having more dad jokes. All right, thanks for listening. On behalf of our team, I'm Edward Brown, wishing you the best of investing. So long. <laughs>